It's a baby who starts a labor. It's not a mother who decides where to give birth. You know, as an expecting doctor, you should attend a childbirth education class. And then you can choose what kind of birth are you looking for. Water birth is water is one of the ways to cope with that pain. Uh, the pain coping capacity for her increases a little. The other option is an episiotomy. Though this is done routinely in India, but according to WHO, the rate shouldn't be more than 15%. Mm. But in India, the rate is actually, I mean, it's done routinely everywhere. Mm. Hypnobirthing as a way, as a tool to go with that pain. Your body was able to conceive this baby most of the time naturally. And uh, your body has the ability to give birth uh, in a way that you want. So I'm sure you will, you can do it and you will do it. Welcome everyone to the Pregnancy Podcast by iMums. We have a very special guest with us here today. We have none other than Dr. Sneha Shah. She's a women's health expert, very, very passionate about women's health across the spectrum, especially pregnancy. In her career, she supported more than 1500 women during their birthing experience personally. She formerly founded Birth Home a natural birthing center that promoted natural birthing in so many women and she saw a whooping 85% natural deliveries under her care. Now currently she is the founder of Fem First, an organization that is focusing on the women's well-being. Welcome Dr. Sneha Shah. Thank you so much Rani for having me here. So uh, you have so much experience about birthing and you assisted so many birthings. Uh, so today we wish to talk about everything around the birthing, uh, you know, whichever birthing woman chooses. So firstly, I want to ask you, uh, what are the things which a family, a couple should know before they go through their birthing experiences? Do you think the family are, today are getting themselves educated enough before they go through the birthing? Of course, education plays a huge role. They should be prepared or what are they going to uh, foresee while either they are into last weeks of their pregnancy, labor, as well as birth. So preparing themselves actually helps them to achieve the kind of birth they are looking for. Today many women... So there is a classic choice between C-section and a natural birthing. Some women, they desire to go for an elective C-section. Uh, many women, they do want to try for a natural birthing. How can someone choose which mode of birthing is right for them? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very beautiful question. So if, if there is a complication either with a mother or a baby, I think uh, going ahead with what the doctor chooses is really important because at the, at the top most, I think the safety of mother and baby plays a huge role. That should be the focus. And if the focus is that if there is a risk either to the mother or the baby, uh, going ahead with a C-section uh, is a life-saving surgery. But on the other hand, choosing elective C-section just because of a maharat that we see very often, that should not be there. Or women should at least try um, and, you know, uh, try for a normal birth because that's a physiological event. It's a event, it's a process that happens internally within the body. And women is capable to have a vaginal birth. I met a doctor recently and she's saying that uh, now natural birthing is in the trend. I mean, she made this statement. What she went to say is, so many more women today are looking for natural birthing and asking their healthcare providers very proactively. Uh, why do you think so? How the system can help so that the women get their own desired mode of natural birthing? Today, every person, I mean, especially during their pregnancy, they want their best. They're getting health conscious, they're eating better, they are getting better, you know, information there. Uh, proactively doing exercise that can prepare them physically, emotionally, as well as informationally to get the kind of birth they're looking for. Um, so I would say yes, there's a trend because there was always a demand, but I think the awareness has increased and now the, the family, the expecting couple are asking questions from the doctor about, uh, you know, what kind of birth and what to expect, what happens during the labor. That information, that entire spectrum of getting ready, getting prepared for the day is really important. Uh, so there are a couple of things. One thing is uh, the information as we were talking about, getting the right information which is scientifically proven, which is evidence-based, to exercising, 
it has to be a balance between rest and activity. So exercising from um, from a trained professional, that's very, very important. And third thing is to read about it, to talk about their fear, their anxiety, uh, and not to just the care providers, but maybe their partners directly, because there's a lot of pressure which comes along, you know, the pressure of having either this kind of birth or that kind of birth. So I think rather than that, that anxiety and fear that she has, I think that has to be talked aloud. Mm. And uh, she should be talking to a care provider, to her partner, to her uh, bit of instructor who she's taking classes with so that she feels at peace. And the question that is nagging around all the time, she has the answer and then she can choose the best for her family. Yeah, yeah. That's quite insightful. Um, today we are hearing that so many women, those who are in pregnancy, they have a fear for labor whether it's going to be very painful, what's going to happen. And almost every mother have heard some, uh, you know, horror birth story of a fellow mother from their family or friends, right? So, and you are the one who assisted so many women through natural birthing. So, uh, what would you tell them? Is it really something they should be fearful about? I would say labor is crazy. It is crazy, but it is doable. Every woman on the earth has done that, been doing that, and that's where we see the population of India, right? <laughs> so uh, it is doable. Mm. And there is an anxiety, there is a fear, there, which is unknown, right? The woman doesn't know. And hearing the stories here and there of the fellow, you know, uh, friends and family is because they weren't ready. You know, asking questions is really important. So that would mean that they need to know first and then to ask questions, right? And uh, reading, there are a lot of birth stories which are available. And I'll tell you, these are Indian women who have given birth uh, with the full autonomy. And um, they are no different, right? They are same, just like us. What helped them was to prepare and uh, to think about what they want to do and how do they want to do and be and having a supportive partner. So that is the key and having a care provider who can trust, who believes in the process and is always there. Lovely. Would like to understand from your experience, can you give more um, guidance? Uh, today there is a mother, she is having f fear for her labor. What she should do so that she feels more confident about her birthing and eventually go through the process. So that fear is real. Mm. And um, talking about that, you know, talking about what is it that she's fearful about. Because most of the time what happens is she's either on search engine asking about the questions which makes her things even more fearful or she's not able to express her feelings, express her emotions because she feels that uh, you know, she's the only one, but believe me, every pregnant woman undergoes, even I was pregnant, I had a lot of fear and anxiety, yeah. which is absolutely normal, it's also hormonal. Mm -hmm. So what can be done is that talking aloud about it, reading, and what exactly is she fearful about? Is she fearful about the process? Mm -hmm. Is she fearful about the pain? Is she fearful about the whether she can do it or not? Mm -hmm. Does she have any kind of pressure that she wants? Mm -hmm. uh, do she has it? Or either that's, that's just a general fear of how is she going to cope with that. Yeah. Because today the birth, you know, when a woman is around 37 or 38 weeks, the intervention starts. Mm -hmm. And these external interventions at times is not required, especially mm -hmm. in the lowest pregnancy, right? So yeah. these actually increase the pain. In, yeah. And then the woman is not able to produce enough hormones to cope with that pain. Mm. So that is again one thing. If it is possible in your case that you can um, have a spontaneous labor, I think that's the best way. Mm. And uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. And believe me, it's the baby who starts the labor. It's not, the, <laughs> it's not a mother who decides when to give birth. Yeah. So when the baby is ready, your body is ready for the labor. Yeah. So having a care provider, who can, who have the patience to wait until the spontaneous labor starts. Of course, the caveats are that she's doing fine, her baby is growing well, her scans are normal, her reports are normal. These are definitely the caveats. But um, what I'm trying to say is that these questions she should be asking her care provider with each and every prenatal visit that she with in spot. It's not just about what kind of medication she should be taking, it's also about her feel yes. of different weeks when she's especially closing close to her um, new date and having the supportive partner is always there 
uh, you know, holding hands either to a visit or maybe a scan, maybe any investigations and be there and just say that I am with you. Yeah. So speak out loud mamas you have, to all your support system and take this advice from Dr. Sneha. Yes, we are always there to help you, um, you know, navigate through this journey to have an extraordinary experience. So you have ran a birth center yourself and you assisted so many mothers during the delivery. And you also mentioned that 85% of the clientele who visits you had gone for natural delivery, natural birthing. Can you tell some birth stories in your experience, which will really, I mean, I, I, I see all the mamas are very, very curious. We run a community, you know, mamas want to know the birth stories of others. Can you tell some two, three empowering birth stories of women yeah, which you experienced? Absolutely. Um, so I think uh, one of the birth I remember, it was middle of the night and you know, I was supporting her through the journey. And uh, she was around till early labor. Her service was three, four centimeters dilated and she was really anxious um, that I want to do, but I don't know how to wear. You know, all these things. And you know, one simple thing I did was with her, I just turned off the lights and I was just talking about how she's visualizing her baby coming through the birth canal. And uh, it really, you know, even I have goosebumps today. And uh, I was just talking to her that she feels her baby in the birth canal. She has that pressure and the baby is on her chest, uh, skin to skin, um, having the most nutritious food in the world and um, I think we were just rolling, we were just talking about it and within half an hour she actually said that she was poopy and I was like uh uh that's like really and um, and the doctor came and checked in and she was actually you know fully dilated mm -hmm. and we did nothing you know as I told that the pain was here mostly and we were just while she was visualizing about how the baby is navigating it really helped her to let go of that fear, let go of the tension and her body did what it was supposed to do. Yeah. And uh, she just had a beautiful birth, beautiful birth. I mean, it was a baby boy and the baby started, we did a breast crawl and the baby was uh, nursing soon and she has, she's also written her birth story might as well, I can just share with you. Right, right. Any other uh, birth story you could think of? A woman, she was around 40 weeks and two days, I guess, and uh, she had come to the birth center um, while she was crying and she was saying, I don't know where I'm going to have this baby and I'm just done being pregnant. I want to see my baby and uh, I think that emotional outflow uh, was huge and uh, she left the center crying and saying, I don't know when I'm going to come back. Uh, I just want this baby. And she was half the way, like 45 minutes away. And she called us again that she's having strong contractions and she had come. She planned to have a water birth, so she was floating in the water. And uh, and she continued saying that, I'll do this, I'll do this. I'm supposed to do this. Um, and i am have my baby blossoming soon. And voila, it was done. It was just a couple of hours of that beautiful labor. And, and this baby came out in the water. Uh, bravely in her arms and it was it was so beautiful it was so beautiful I still remember that moment very heartwarming uh, you mentioned about water birthing mm -hmm. and uh, today there are multiple birthing options we have uh, which people can choose absolutely yeah. uh, so and still not many centers or hospitals are doing it can you throw light on having a birth plan what are the different birthing options we have? Hypnobirthing, water birthing. Yeah. So can you uh, share some ideas so that folks can get more educated and also check with their healthcare providers? Yeah. So I think I would rather change this term to birth preference because birth it's preference. what she prefers and because you can't plan anything yeah. right, right? Yeah. So you can't plan an event, life event. Yeah. So it's a birth preference. Um, so there are multiple levels to it. The preference could be that having a most natural birth where there is no interventions involved. That could be one of your preference. If uh, you know if the things are perfectly fine, you are doing fine, your care provider is absolutely okay with that and your baby is doing fine, you can have the birth where there is no intervention required and the 
there is no routine episiotomy done which is really important yeah. and um, you give birth in the position that you are comfortable with it could be either on the bed where you know like a typical etiotomy position it could be uh, while lying on your all fours it could be while squatting lunging there could be any position that she is comfortable with yeah. right so i think that could be one water birth is what is one of the ways to cope with that pain mm-hmm. because when a baby is inside the water and the water reduces it creates biopsy right mm-hmm. so what happens is the baby is more comfortable uh, the pain coping capacity for her increases a little and uh, and she basically gets into the water while she is around pushing stage and she has the baby inside the water till the entire body comes out she stays inside the water and the moment the body comes out she just takes the baby close to her heart close to her body and once everything is checked she's good to come out so that could be one of the options um the other option is to have a, a birth where a woman gives birth in a lithotomy position where she uh, an episiotomy uh, is done when the baby of you know, the perineum is actually cut to create an ex- extra space for the baby to come out and uh, though this is done routinely in india but according to who the rate shouldn't be more than 15% mm-hmm. but in india the rate is actually i mean it's done routinely everywhere right. so that could be one or um, the other preferences that you are you have practiced hypno birthing in the last weeks of your pregnancy last trimester and you continue to practice hypno birthing as a coping technique this is extremely powerful mm. if a woman you know trust that process and she can continue uh, to practice those visualizations those tools those uh, you know to go with that wave and uh, i have seen couple of or uh, hypno birthing you know where a woman was using hypno birthing as a as a way as a tool to go with her pain and uh, it went pretty amazing what actually happens during hypno birthing how it is different from other modes of natural birthing so there is a there is a complete different philosophy where they're using lot of tools and techniques yeah. uh where there's lot of um everybody is listening to the hypno birthing uh music where it actually helps them to cope with that pain and um, and i have seen women who has practiced hypno birthing is that just sway around during the entire labor and they push their baby even without knowing it once a baby comes out so at times we have to also read a script for them to come out of that entire process mm-hmm. where they could see that they have given birth mm-hmm. and i think i've attended three or four births and you know i think it's a choice it's a choice what the women uh, make for her and what suits to her and her family you stressed um uh, importance of childbirth education what actually happens in a childbirth education session and uh, why it is important i mean do you recommend childbirth education uh, knowledge for every expecting mother before they deliver and if yes what does a typical childbirth education session covers um yeah so childbirth education is for every every pregnant couple you know as an expecting couple a couple should attend a childbirth education class because this is how they can understand the different uh labor and phase labor stages and phases in spite of the fact that you are you may be you know going for a schedule c section for whatever reason but at least uh, getting that information is really important because that will help you to prepare uh, you know uh, and then you can choose what kind of birth are you looking for right so it involves typically the labor different stages phases signs symptoms when should you go to the labor what happen uh, to the hospital what happens when uh, this contraction starts is this a true contraction or maybe just a tardis contraction how is your partner going to support you during that entire phase because i think that's very important she is having contractions it could be painful she's in external support and this is where the partner comes into picture yeah, mm-hmm. so having said that as a couple it is important for uh, a couple to get to attend the class so that yeah. they can have the information where they can be in the same plate you know yeah. same space of what they are looking for and why and this not just prepares you for the day mm. but also prepares you for the breastfeeding for the immediate postpartum and for something which is called as fourth trimester yeah. like at this 3 months of a postpartum how to take care of the baby massage diapering 
uh, how to do it, she's getting enough, breastfeeding, how to take care of oneself, so that is I think important. Yeah. And how to, uh, as a partner, as a dad, new dad, because they're also juggling and struggling with what to do. Yeah. They want to do a lot of stuff, but here I think the question is how. Yeah. So that education will give you the tool of how can you support your little one as well as your wife. That's very beautifully said. I read it somewhere, it resonated with me. Uh, it said that mother carries baby for nine months in the womb, but you know, father is carrying the baby in the head, right? Yes. Yeah, he is also thinking, strategizing how to go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, on this note, how can a partner support uh, the mom who is going to deliver during the pregnancy? How can the partner support? I think starting with the first, you know, scan or, or first visit that you do with the doctor. And to buy a little stuff for your wife, for your, for your, you know, uh, to be baby, uh, discussing about how can they prepare themselves mm. or their even house for the little one, to welcome the little one, uh, to be with her in all the things and things of their life. I think that's a very crucial space, you know. Mm. Today, we are living in, most of us are living in a nuclear family and the visitor birth has not been passed. Today, women has not seen any birth she may not have also seen any women breastfeeding their babies mm -hmm. because today, you know, everybody just busy in their lives. True. So I think having a partner who is supportive, who is, who understands all the emotional ups and downs because pregnancy also brings in a lot of emotional challenges, you know. There's a phase when women is crying and there could be a phase when she's just smiling all the time. So understanding those emotional outflow, understanding the need that she mm -hmm. has, doing the gentle foot massage, taking her to shopping, uh, being with her always, all the visits, the classes, um, I, I, and being with her during the labor and birth is extremely important. That actually helps to create a beautiful bond amongst that family that stays with them forever. Yeah. So, uh, how important? I mean, I heard there is a law that can, uh, not law, one of the guidelines of respectful maternity, that you can choose to have a partner, a birthing partner alongside. Yes. How important is that? And even today, some hospitals are not allowing that. Yeah. What are the rights we have and how can we go about that? So today what happens uh, if a woman is giving birth, during actual birthing position, she is moved to a labor and delivery room, mm -hmm. which is common. Mm -hmm. And many hospitals still today have common delivery rooms where there would be number of births happening at the same time. So that is when they can't allow a male person, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a husband per se, to be a part of the yeah. earth. But you can have a doula, you can bring your friend who can be there throughout your process. Uh, but, but having said that, there are a few hospitals like corporate hospital, which has a single labor and birth room yeah. where the partners can be there. And I think these are the discussions that you should do in your prenatal visit. Mm -hmm. If a partner is down for table, I think she you should be asking that question that I want to attend the birth and uh, will you allow me? Because this is when it can help them to prepare and expect of what are they going to uh, be a part of, you know. Right. Just being during labor, some, uh, you know, partners may want to be holding hands mm -hmm. during birth. And uh, sometimes, you know, I get a question that I am really scared of uh, of blood. And what do I do? How do I tell birth? Do I really want to support? So if you are that person, I think just holding hands to her, supporting her and saying that, giving her water if possible, talking to her and saying that you're doing good. I think this is super supportive. Great. Uh, while choosing, I mean, you mentioned that during prenatal visits, we should ask this question. I think... We should be asking so many more questions before we choose the right uh, care provider. So can you list on what all the questions an expecting couple should ask before choosing their care yeah. provider? Yeah. I think the first question could be that uh, if you are looking for a normal vaginal birth or a natural vaginal birth, you can ask the question as simple as that, what is your rate of C-section in the hospital? <laughs> you know, that would help them to understand whom are they going to, yeah. right? And what they could end up into. The next question could be that I may not want, I don't want a routine episiotomy. It should be done only if required. That could be one of the questions. I want my husband or a doula to be with me during the entire process. So that would uh, understand that there would be a birthing partner with her throughout the phase. 
So that for the another question. The other question could be that I don't want a routine induction, mm -hmm. which sadly is happening today at 38 weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, so that could be one question that I don't want a routine induction. Of course, at times it becomes medically necessary, important, but not doing it routinely. So I think these are the few questions that you can ask. Yeah. This is very insightful. But sadly today, if doctor chooses, I mean, of course, for obvious life-saving reasons, they are choosing c-section episiotomy or induction regular induction uh when they choose for whatever reasons it, it definitely hoping for the best intentions but often couple don't have choice doctor coming and saying i have to do an episiotomy or i have we have to go for an emergency section the couple are not having a choice uh, and many doctors are also saying ki, um, in some cases let's say for which mostly Many of the C-sections are happening, a cord, cord loop around one single loop or baby pooped inside. Correct. So how can somebody feel empowered? Because when the doctor is saying that's the end game for them. Correct. So how practical this is to yeah. happen? So, uh, you know, so a baby is in the uterus, mm. which is a very small space and they're always like, you know, squeezing and it has a placenta, it has a lot of fluid and it has one umbilical cord and the baby already has the, they can touch, they can hold, they can, you know. So, umbilical cord is the first toy yeah. for them <laughs> and this is, it is filled with gelatin which is called a right. rotten gel, right? It's not like a, like a bamboo rope, it's like a very soft, squishy uh, cord that, that is around the net if it is. And this baby continues to play and they just group it around their neck once, maybe their under arm, arms or maybe their shoulders or maybe their legs. They continue to move because the baby is moving inside, yes. right? So what you can see in front of the scan is the baby has one cord around the neck and probably the next scan there is nothing and the third scan there could be like lot, yeah. right? We don't know. Yeah. So until and unless the baby is having any kind of distress, mm. that definitely needs a surgical intervention. Mm. But uh, in my birthing center, in my birth center, so there were 30 babies, 30% of the babies who were born with a cord around the neck and what as a care provider, the doctors, uh, the midwives were doing were just, you know, using their little finger and unlooping them. Mm. So if that baby is doing fine, there is no reason to schedule a C-section. Because as I said, the baby continues to move. Yes. And at during labor, you don't know if the baby is having a single loop, maybe two or maybe not. Yeah. So that should not be a reason for a scheduled C-section. Mm. A client of mine, in 2019, which was the start of COVID, and she had taken a scan at the last weeks of pregnancy, and there were four cords around the baby's body. And the first thing the doctor tells was to go for a C-section. And uh, since it was COVID, her parents were not able to travel, and she was all by herself. And she always wanted to have a normal vaginal birth. Yeah. And uh, so I was working with her throughout, and there is no exercise because the babies are inside. There's nothing you can do externally. Uh, she continued to have faith and she did multiple scans but all these scans did show that there was uh, multiple cords around the baby's body. Um, uh, and I was working with her throughout, you know, initial phases of labor. I was on phone with her, on call with her and uh, she went to the hospital while she was in active stage and uh, and within a couple of hours she gave birth and the baby, when the baby came out, it had four cords around the body. And absolutely fine, baby was smiling and you know, big, beautiful, healthy, chubby baby came out. So, so I think most important lesson that we learn here is that one, trust your process. And uh, if the baby is under distress, the doctor will do a C-section and that can be done in a hospital, it's just, you know, 10 minutes away. So I think it's important for you to not undergo a scheduled C-section because your baby has a cord around the neck. Because as I said, the baby continues to move. And one of the scans that you would see either one or two or maybe multiple and the other scan may not have any cause. Yeah. So I think that should not be a reason. Another reason which commonly says is meconium, like yeah, baby pass tools, one. yeah, yeah, inside. Yeah, right. And uh, because of that reason, C-sections are scheduled or emergency sections are done. Right. So what is your take on it? Is it necessary to... Yeah, so I think first of all, let me just talk about an incident that happened uh, one the time. A uh, patient, a client called me and she said that um, her doctor is saying that the baby passed poop inside mm -hmm. and she needs to go and she needs to undergo a C-section and when I asked her how did the doctor come to know, she said because the doctor did uh, a test or whatever, you know, 
but you can only come to know that the baby has either poop or not when there is a release of water bag. Mm-hmm. When the water bag has greenish tinge, that would mean the baby has part of first poop, which is called a meconium. But not always it's a reason to do a section, not an emergency section. In case, if the baby has, uh, you know, ingested that tooth and uh, has then respiratory disorders, that would be an emergency to do a C-section right away. But most of the time, the baby does pretty well. If it is well diluted, if it is very light green in color, the baby is absolutely fine. That river might need both monitoring. So I have to see if the baby is doing fine and if the babies are perfectly fine, there is no reason to bo- to do a C-section because of that reason. Yeah. Also, an increasingly number of women, uh, I mean, of course, everyone has a choice. They, end of the day, they have the choice to choose their own delivery method. Because of the fear of labor, women are scheduling C-sections. What's your take on it? What would you advise to them? I, I would say your body is capable of doing uh, a birth, baby coming out from your vagina, from your birth canal. It's extremely important for you to understand your body is built in such a way. If you are doing fine, your baby is doing fine. And if you have that fear, I think information is the key. When you can discuss about the care provider, read good birth stories. There are a lot of, um, you know, content which is available today on social media. Of course, evidence is based. Um, I think that really helps her to understand that she's not alone in this journey. Yeah. There are many women giving birth at the same time. So you're not alone. Your body is meant to do that. And I'm sure you will do it. That's quite inspiring. Thanks for giving this reassurance to all the audience who are watching. According to your experience, what are the birthing practices that should be done, but we are missing in a big scale today? Would you want to highlight some of such practices? So there are a couple of uh, things that can be done or should be done. One is uh, optimal cord clamping. Basically, that means to clamp the cord once the umbilical cord stops pulsating. Because umbilical cord is the connection between placenta and the baby. baby and yeah. it continues to pulsate even Pulse. after birth. Okay. So not clamping it right away, but clamping it once it stops pulsating. I think that's really important. What is the minimum duration that we should leave the umbilical cord to pulsate and then do the clamping? So what I would say is that it continues to pulsate until the time it pulsates. Mm-hmm. Um, don't clamp it and you can clamp it after that. So usually it takes around 30 seconds to at times even 2 minutes. Mm-hmm. And uh, that is the time when you can clamp the cord. Okay. Do you think many healthcare practitioners are following the optimal cord clamping today? How much percentage? Yeah. In in how many birthings this is being happening today? The government has made it mandatory. There has been a rule by the government where they are focusing more on these practices. Mm-hmm. While the care providers say that they have done a delayed cord clamping, but it happens within 10 seconds of the birth. So I think that's, if you are there, you can check and you can talk to a care provider that is still pulsating and please wait. And why it is very important to do this optimal cord clamping? What are the benefits of doing this? So there is a lot of nourishment which is there. It also is supposed that uh, it gives a baby a transitional time of a minute so that they can then start using all their body functions. Mm -hmm. So till that they have that that nutrition, that oxygenated blood which is available for them. So that is number one which is the most important reason. Uh, Number two is that it, it is proven that the babies who have had a, a delayed cord clamping will have lesser chances of having anemia. Oh, interesting. And it could be done even if you had a vaginal birth, even if you had a C-section. You know, um, that is possible. Two is skin to skin. Once a baby comes out, there's something called a gentle C-section currently. Uh, so, you know, you can also maybe read about that. So, once the baby comes out, the baby should come to the mother first. Um, of course, the baby is doing really fine, baby's pain, color, after everything is fine, the baby should come to the mother first. Skin to skin is really important, so that could be the second thing. And the third thing is that immediate breastfeeding. Mm. So the breastfeeding should start within an hour of their birth. That's extremely important. And again, as I said, it could be either a vaginal birth or a C-section. It is possible, it is doable. So uh, again, that could be one of the questions in your prenatal visit. That you can ask your care provider that these are three practices that I'm looking for, and uh, and you know you can get it done. 
अमेजिंग सो फॉर दो वॉचिंग डिलेड कॉड क्लैम्पिंग स्किन टू स्किन ऑप्टिमल कॉड क्लैम्पिंग या स्किन टू स्किन एंड मेकअप प्लस फ्री सो दीज आर द थिंग्स प्लीज चेक विद योर हेल्थ प्रोवाइडर दे वॉन्ट टू मेक अ लॉट ऑफ डिफरेंस टॉरिस नेहा यू मैंशन ह्यूज बेनिफिट्स ऑफ गोइंग फॉर अ वॉटर बर्थ बट टूडे अनफॉर्चुनेटली वी डोंट हैव मेनी केयर प्रोवाइडर्स प्रोवाइडिंग वॉटर बर्थ थिंग सो सामबडी स्टिल वॉन्ट टू हैव दट एडवांटेज वॉट इज द नेक्स्ट बेस्ट आल्टरनेटिव See, yeah, I mean, water uh, birthing is not available, and not everybody would want to choose a water birth, right? So there's something called as hydrotherapy, where you can use water. It could be hot pack, it could be cold pack, it could be taking shower, it could be just pouring water, it could be sitting in a tub if possible. You know, these could be few things that are still doable if you have all these things, and these are available in any kitchen, any room, any hospital. So you can still avail the benefits of water. Right. So. basically use all these techniques during your birthing be little more closer to water yes, yes. yes that will help in water. relaxes and but helps in pain management right. that's very insightful any last advice that you i mean one message that you wish to give for all the expecting couple who are watching this yeah. uh, i just want to say that your body was able to conceive this baby most of the time naturally and uh, your body has the ability to give birth Yeah, uh, in a way that you want. So I'm sure you will. You can do it, and you will do. That's very uh, reassuring and inspirational to hear. Thank you so much, Doctor Sneha. It was very lovely having you here. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much.